years ago, I made a video about PID tuning and I was really basic in my video. And since then, I have gotten countless requests to make video, more videos about tuning. And I've avoided making tuning videos kind of at all costs because I really appreciate how complicated it can be to make a quad function properly. So this quad that you see in front of you is the power pick, the FPV cycle power pick, with the FPV cycle 2203 3450 kV motors and the Gemfan 25, sorry, 5125 blades, which is very, very lightweight, low weight, low load blade, and uh, the JHE MCU 30 amp 4S toothpick all-in-one board, which performs fantastic, by the way, so far, and a 4S 1100 milliamp battery. The all-up weight is about 300 grams, and uh, it's not really an ultralight. It's pretty light. Not really an ultralight. I don't really subscribe to the 250 gram mark of these sort of ultralights. I d the reason I don't call it an ultralight is because I don't really sacrifice motor weight for lightness. And this particular quad, I would consider an advanced build, an advanced quad to, to process and tune and get to fly appropriately. I would not recommend this to a beginner or even an intermediate or somebody that is not willing to put a, a great deal of effort into trying to make this thing work properly. Also, the motors were never designed for this particular purpose. They were designed for a Cinewhoop. This thing, they were designed for a Cinewhoop. I just happened to push things harder and harder and see what I could do with them. We do have lower KV motors coming for this setup, but I actually think you're gonna run into a lot of the same issues with those lower KV motors, and I don't, as in with the setup, and I don't really, I don't really fully know why, and you'll see in this video why that is. If you fly this particular setup on a 3S battery, beautiful, perfect. Don't even bother with 4S, and that's great. <laughs> like don't like uh, this when I get the 3S batteries in, which we have coming. This is going to be a 3S quad. It will be plenty quick, plenty performance, and it'll actually be probably right around the 250 gram mark if you just did a little bit more weight savings on this thing. So that is what I would strongly recommend for this quad, and I think that uh, even a beginner could run that with no problems, and it's going to be great. So this particular frame is uh, three millimeter arms, 1.5 millimeter body plates. And it has a num this overall setup has a number of issues. And before moving forward, I will point out that I have the identical drivetrain on this quad, which is the five inch four ride, three millimeter arms, 1.5 millimeter body plate, same exact all in one flight controller, same exact motors, same exact props, totally default EMU flight, beautiful performance, no issues, 4S, 1100 milliamp like five minutes flight time is beautiful. Like it performs really, really well. And I cannot fully explain why. Now the issues that I have on this one, same thing on this one. This one actually has 36, uh, 50 KV motors on it. The previous prototypes of these motors before they actually came out. Uh, same, same exact flight controller, same, same, everything is the same. Three inch ducted, beautiful performance, no issues at all. It's just when you put it on this particular quad that it has issues. Okay. So, before continuing, I'm going to point out a couple things. First of all, I'm not an engineer. Second of all, I'm a normal person. Third of all, I'm not a developer. Fourth of all, I'm not an engineer, developer, any kind of expert of anything at all. The only thing that I have going for me in this discussion or the only reason I'm making this video is because I've been doing this for five or six years. And for somebody that's been doing this for five or six years, honestly, I'm embarrassed for how much time I've spent on this quad. But still, I run into so many issues that I think that a lot of other people will run into as well. And before moving forward again, I will also put another disclaimer that everything here presented is based on my personal experience, not anybody else's experience, my personal experience. And in the world of science or law, world of science and law, the lowest level of valid information comes from an expert witness which is educated and or highly experienced in the field. This is considered the lowest level of valid information. It's you, the, the highest level is going to be a double blind uh, study, like meta-analysis meta of multiple double blind studies across scientific fields. That's gonna be the best possible information source. So what I'm presenting here is based on my experience of somebody that is 
I mean, there isn't really educated area in this area. I'm just not an engineer of any sort. So take this all with a grain of salt. Also, the way I approach issues and tuning is very unconventional. This is not something that I've seen anybody present or do. And I will tell you that this video is not really intended for the beginner. Uh, an intermediate or a beginner can watch it and they will probably be afraid of this field entirely because of the potential issues that you can run into. And um, you could watch it, you could listen to it, but I'm sorry if it's just too much for you to kind of fully take in and understand. And I hope that you never have to deal with this kind of garbage. Okay, let's first start off with the quad setup and talk about how I set up my things and why I do them, do things the way I do. So this particular setup is, like I said, a power pick 5 inch, these 2203 motors, 3450 KV, 5 inch props, 4S, all in one toothpick board. There's really nothing special about this setup other than the fact that it's kind of pushing things to the limits and it's they're they're just beyond the limits of what the code can do and this is my own personal perspective of flight code and the way it's set up i think the flight code has been designed all flight codes are designed for a particular performance envelope and performance or a particular style of setup and so when you scale a quad up or down in size or anything you kind of stay inside this performance envelope. When you scale up in quad size, you usually end up with a quad that is heavier and has much larger blades. So you end up with a lower um, power to weight ratio, but you end up with a better, sometimes, disc loading ratio. So this, is, this might get a little complicated, but let's put it this way you have larger control surfaces on a bigger quad but you have lower power to weight when you move down in size you have smaller control surfaces because you have smaller blades but you usually end up having a higher power to weight ratio if you're building it kind of in the performance category and so that's kind of staying within this performance envelope that the code seems to want to look for and if you step outside of this envelope, as in too much performance, not on the low, low side, if your quad is just really underpowered, it's, not, it's just going to be underpowered. The code won't have an issue dealing with it because it's just underpowered. But if you step outside of this envelope in the higher end, in terms of having way too much power for the all of the weight of the quad and way too much control surface area for the overall quad, you will run into a number of issues. So this particular quad has very large props for the weight of the quad, 300 grams, and it has a lot of power for the overall inertial, rotational inertia of the quad. And I think, I don't know if this is true, but I think this is why you run into a lot of these issues. Now, right off the bat, the main problem that I had with the quad was uh, a problem that I'm embarrassed that took me three days to solve. It was me and two other people actually. I brought in two other people in with this and between us we had like 15 plus years of quad experience, mini quad experience, and none of us could figure out what it was until I kind of stumbled upon the solution. And so here's the video of the original quad with no props on. Not touching this model. I have seen this a number of times and, and a lot of times I just give up and sometimes it just works itself out for whatever reason. I, like, I don't know why the quad will change over time, but sometimes it's it gets better with time. So this doesn't, I don't know, maybe components wear or something, they improve. But this was a problem that took, me, took us three days to solve and the solution was not what I thought it was. So. When I see a quad like this and a problem like this, I run through a couple of things. And in this particular situation, I knew I was gonna make this video because I built this quad for this video specifically. So I decided to first, before doing anything, run through different versions of firmware and code to try and see if anything changes. Now, this video is, I mean, PIDs are gonna be like the last thing in this video and that's like the last thing that I even bother trying, but, this is my way of tuning, honestly. I just go through different firmware versions and I see if one of them matches because all of them are a little bit different. They change the filter settings, they change the way things work, and some of them match the quad better 
than others. And I, I am I'm not partial to any particular code. I'll try them all that I can put on the same quad. So Betaflight 3.5.7 is the last very, very well performing stuff firmware version before they jump to the 4 series of Betaflight. And I am actually not a big fan of 4.x because of a number of things that I'm going to present later on in this video. But for this particular quad, I first tried, well, it came with 4.1.5, and then I tried 3.5.7, then I tried 4.2 without RPM filtering, and then I tried Emu Flight, and all of them do exactly the same thing. So then, once I tried all the code, I usually call this a noise problem, vibrational noise, not electronic noise. That's what I call this problem almost all the time. So what I do is this. The flight controller is now floating completely above the mounting screws, significantly better, but if I throttle up, that mid throttle point is still giving me oscillations. By floating the flight controller over the frame and not having it attached to anything, you're pretty much removing all chance of vibrational noise getting to the gyro. And that, I mean, I guess it could transmit through the motor wires, but it's so much less than, I mean, you could just hold the thing. Basically, I'm trying to reduce any potential vibration getting to the gyro or to the flight control board and I'm still having the same issue. Now at this point, a lot of people actually chimed in and said you have, because uh, I had this uh, thread on, on, on the Facebook group, uh, people said you have a bad gyro, something's messed up, flight controller is bad, tried a different flight controller. I've actually tried the same exact setup on four different flight controllers. I've tried the um, GFRC board, two different GFRC boards. I've tried the Mama board. I've tried uh, a beta board, not particularly this one, but I'm going to use this one as an example of something in a second. And you get a lot of the same situations, a lot of the same issues. And so when the filter... When, uh, when floating the board didn't work, I knew that the filters were pointless. And I know I don't have black box on any of these boards, so I can't really use black box for anything. And uh, I knew that it wasn't a filter problem. So then I started looking at everything else, and we were so stumped at what to do next. And so then I started, I just glanced at the top of the board, and I'm like, it's actually, it's this board. This board, I glanced at the top board, and I'm like, huh, there's no capacitors on this board at all. There's a couple of them. There's like four of them underneath. There's nothing on here. And what I had originally was a capacitor on my XT60 connector. And so a while ago, I remember somebody telling me that um, it's pointless to put a capacitor on the end of an XT60 or end of a, a wire on the battery on the battery connector because it just doesn't do anything. And so I decided to move the capacitor from the connector from or just add a capacitor from the connector to the actual battery pads and here's what happened so here's the solution it had nothing to do with software works perfectly so this is what it looks like right now and i'll explain why it looks like this uh in a minute but so what is actually happening is that when you have a capacitor at the end of a wire, you are adding both the capacitance of the wire to the capacitor as well as the response of the wire to the capacitor as well. So I am not an electrical engineer, but from what I have deciphered in this industry, you have to have your capacitor as close to the component, electronic component you're trying to filter as possible in order to get the maximum function out of it because you need this capacitor to be as fast of a responding capacitor as possible to be able to absorb the fluctuations and voltage as a voltage and current as much as possible, as close as possible to filter as good as it can. And so the first place I ever saw this was Flight 1 when they presented the fact that you need capacitors <laughs> to be able to tune your quad because if you don't, it's just gonna flutter into space. And uh, if you remember way back when, we actually had these electrolytic capacitors on all of our ESCs. We would just demand smaller and smaller and smaller. 
And so we ended up with boards that have nothing on there. And, and on these new all-in-one boards, they just kind of throw out everything, shove some FETs on there and call it a day. I mean, that's just awful electronic design. But basically what's happening, as far as I know, I'm not an engineer, but hey, as far as I know, uh, apparently what's happening is the noise is being filtered. Okay, let's backtrack a bit. Let's talk about how motors work and how ESCs work. So here's a motor. Motors have stators with uh, windings wrapped around them and they have magnets. And what happens is uh, moving magnetic field induces an electric current and moving electric field induces a magnetic current. So the way the ESC controls a motor is by turning these poles on and off and it pushes and pulls against the magnets and spins it around. But the way it gets started or even knows where the bell is and what's happening because it needs to keep track of what's happening with the motor in order to do what it does. If you take any two... two motor wires and you short them and you try to spin the motor, you will feel a notable resistance in the motor. And that's because the moving magnetic field is inducing an electric current in some of the, uh, in all of the, the poles actually, but it's inducing an electric current that's getting fed back through the wire and back into the other uh, phase of the stator, which is resisting the movement of magnets. And so what happens is that when the motor spins, it's constantly giving voltage feedback back to the ESC so that the ESC, I mean, it, the, this is how the ESC functions. It needs to be able to listen to the motor to be able to see what's happening so that it can actually do its job. And so that's why you don't want to actually braid your motor wires. I've actually never heard of an issue with braided motor wires, but the motor wires can cause a moving electric field induces the magnetic current, uh, sorry, Basically, they can interfere. So you don't want to braid your wires. But I know a lot of people do braid their wires and they have never heard of any issues. But it's usually not a good idea because it can lead to desyncs and various noise issues and whatnot. So basically what's happening is that in a system that is drastically overpowered, you're getting a lot of back noise into the system. And so <laughs> this is why running an overpowered system is a challenge. You need to make sure you have really good filtering into this, in the system to just be able to make the thing function. Otherwise, even with no props on, the motors heat up so hot and the flight controller is burning hot. I don't even know how this thing didn't burn out just from me testing it with nothing on. So now that we have the capacitance issue solved, let's go out and fly the darn thing. So I first started with Betaflight 4.2. Sucks. Awful. And this is the issue that I have with 4.2 it seems to require you to run RPM filtering. And I'll talk about RPM filtering later on as well. For some reason, a lot of the time on the quads I run, you get this weird bobble when you're going fast. And I hate it. And it's awful. And I won't run it because of that reason. And also, I despise VTX tables. But that's a totally another story entirely. So... Then I tried 3.5.7, same deal. Then I tried, uh, not same deal, sorry. 3.5.7 doesn't have the baubles at all, but the reason why I tried different firmware versions, again, is because I don't like tuning anything. So I'll just run different firmware versions and see what fits the quad, and if the filters fit properly, then I'll just run that firmware, and I'll just figure out how to tune it as best I can, and that'll be good enough for me, and I'm happy with that. So 3.5.7 doesn't have the bobble issue, but it does have the flutter, prop uh, motor flutter when you're going mid throttle to high throttle. And so if I turn the PIDs way down, this is the first time I'm introducing PIDs. The first time I'm doing anything with PIDs here is when it can fly and I'm getting these flutters. And so the first thing I do is turn my PIDs way down, turn them down to like 25 across the board. My, my Ds are down to like five or six flutters go away. As I start pouring on the PIDs, then I start seeing flutter, like a motor flutter, but I'm not, I hope you know what I mean when I say motor flutter. You hear these high, 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 high frequency oscillations in the motors when you're hitting the gas. And so when I start increasing my PIDs and I'm getting flutter before the quad actually starts flying well because it's well tuned in the PID department, I know that I've got something else going on. Either I've got uh, too much filtering or I don't have the right filters or uh, there's some other stuff amiss that is happening. So I threw uh, Emu Flight on there, particularly because I, I, I mean, we have a lot of filter tools these days with the code, but I have access to the developers which will help me tune it and I know how to use 
a lot of the filter tools in Emu Flight. And there's kind of more options here or there sort of kind of presented to me. I'm not an expert, but I'm just, I've been using it a lot. So I kind of know what to look for and what to do a little bit. So I've adjusted the filters up and down and tried to figure things out and I've adjusted the PIDs and I just could not get rid of this flutter or get the thing to fly right at all. I was still having a couple of little ticks here and there, which are usually indicative of um, no, vibrational noise issues, but I don't have black box on this thing, so I can't figure that out. So it's super frustrating. What am I left to do? I actually added another capacitor to this thing to try and get rid of some things, and that added th this this one here. This is a new kind of capacitor that um, somebody's been testing, and it'll be in the FPV cycle soon. Um, it's just a lower ESR capacitor. It, it's even more responsive than the Panasonic one that's become the default Panasonic the default capacitor. I just added another one there to see if that would solve things. It really didn't solve anything. Um, another thing about capacitors real quick is that you really want to run the genuine um, Panasonic ones. The one on the left here is a Chinese um, knockoff, as far as I know, and it actually does work. I just you might as well just run the one that we know works well the genuine panasonic one and you also want to have it on a wire that's at least 20 gauge with at least with maximum length of like 20 to 25 millimeters you really don't want more than that because of the same reason why you don't want the capacitor at the end of the battery lead so getting back to this quad and the flutter and the noise so then i put it on 4.2 and <clears throat> threw some rpm filtering on there and so I'm really confused at why RPM filtering exists in the way that it does, not particularly because of its performance, the way it works, but because of the business side of it. Betaflight is free. It's always been free, open source. They work for zero money. And honestly, all they're doing is making awesome code for China, for these Chinese companies to make a buck off of because that's all they're doing. These companies are taking their code, throwing it on their quads, making some ready to flies and selling a ton of it to everybody else around the world. So I don't understand why Betaflight even continues to exist. I actually feel like it, this is very controversial. I feel like they should either lock it down and restrict its use or maybe start charging for it or in some way, in some, I mean, it's so, I know that the internet runs on open source. Like honestly, most of the stuff that makes the internet possible is open source based. And I understand it's, place in everything, but it's really hard to do anything well when you're not getting paid for it. Like it's really hard to dedicate your time and energy to it. Yes, you have passion. Yes, you have drive. But at the end of the day, you still need to make a living. You still need to pay for food. You still probably want to have a family and that costs money. So it's really weird to see Betaflight continuing when they don't have any income. And it's just confusing. So what's really confusing is why on earth they are almost requiring RPM filtering in 4.2 to function correctly when JESC is charging for it, which I love, by the way, before because of all those reasons. I think it's a fantastic idea for JESC to charge a dollar per ES. It's like a dollar fifteen or fifty dollar fifty or something per ESC, which is fantastic with the number of quads that are being built and the performance increase that you get from running RPM filtering in some situations, not all situations. I think it's a great idea to charge a dollar per ESC to have this functionality. Now, I don't know if RPM filtering is uh, is a license thing on uh, BL Heli 32. I forgot. I don't remember. But on BLHeli S, I do know that you do have to license it. And the reason why I've stayed away from it and I haven't talked a lot about it is that I do also know that JESC or just RPM filtering in general can lead to ESCs burning out or just burning ESCs. And I've burnt a lot of ESCs in my time. And so I will avoid things that can potentially cause that. And I will not recommend them because I don't want to deal with the um, service that I have to provide people. Because outside of FPV cycle or anything else, I provide a ton of service to people out there in the community. And I love doing it. I love helping people, but I will not recommend things that cause more work for myself. So I have now, I mean, I use RPM filtering, obviously. It does help improve things quite a bit in some situations, not all situations. And so this particular quad with this kind of performance and this kind of profile, it all but requires you to run RPM filtering. 
And Betaflight 4.2 is, as far as I know, the only thing that actually functions with RPM filtering. I don't know, maybe KISS does or not, whatever. But it actually functions with, with RPM filtering. And um, it drastically improved everything. So the benefits of RPM filtering are profound if it's on the right quad. It doesn't work on like a lot of little tiny micros and it doesn't work in a lot of other areas, but if it's in the right setup and the right quad, the main advantages are that you can reduce your filters because you now have, the way it works as far as my understanding goes is that the flight controller now can, can know exactly what the motor is doing at all times so that it can adjust its setup or its uh, output to manage the potential uh, vibrations coming off the motors because you now have multiple notch filters per motor that you can apply to the system. And so when you have tiny little narrow notch filters applied to the system, you don't need a whole lot of filtering elsewhere because your noise is coming, your vibrational noise is coming from the motors. It's not coming from anything else. Nothing else is vibrating on the quad. So, so when you have that, you can reduce your filters and you can improve performance because filters actually increase the latency in the system because the now the flight controller needs to actually listen is delayed. The flight controller needs to filter it and then get the information to process it and then output it again. So Oscar Lang has a great uh, rundown on how to do RPM filtering or just apply it. It's really easy to put on. I'm not even gonna explain it. But basically RPM filtering on here, drastic improvement, no more dipping when you pump the throttle at all, but I'm still getting some light fluctuations in uh, high perform or high throttle situations. I'm still tuning my PIDs, but again, I have not even talked about PIDs here. All I have done is everything else. I mean, I've talked for now 30, 40 minutes, and I have not even touched PIDs. And so this is why I don't even talk about PIDs, because if everything else on the quad is running correctly, you can almost put anything in the PIDs and they should work fine. I think PIDs should, I'm not a developer, but I think PIDs should maybe just be sliders, like 1 to 10. It's, it's such a broad window as long as everything else is working correctly that it doesn't really matter so much. You need to focus more on everything outside of the PIDs in order to get a properly flying quad. And so it's just mind-boggling that I have gone through all this effort I mean, honestly, it shouldn't have been this much effort. I should have just put RPM filtering 4.2 with the cap in the right spot, and I would have been here. I would have saved myself a week of dealing with this crap. But I did this because I wanted to present all these issues for hopefully somebody out there that might have these issues. Anyways, so this quad is not yet performing as well as I wanted to perform. I still have some oscillations. I haven't reduced my filters completely. I still have some filter work to do. I don't have black box on here, but I don't think that's going to be an issue because RPM filtering does a great job of it. And uh, black box doesn't really help with PIDs as much as I wish it would because um, there's so much else involved with it. I am gonna continue to reduce my filters. But at the end of the day, if I was to run four inch props on this thing, it's gonna fly fine. If I was to run 3S on this thing, it's gonna fly fine. And so I am just working really hard to try and squeeze the maximum performance out of this setup. I do know that these 3450 kV motors should be able to be plenty efficient because I have run them on this setup with great efficiency. And so I do know that there's something else going on, probably vibrations and fluctuations and something in the motors that are drawing a lot more amps than I, they should be drawing. But at this point in time, just run 3S, just run RPM filtering 4.2, 3S, and just call it a day. Like it's not worth going through all this effort. And I'm probably not gonna make another video like this for a long time for a lot of the same reason. The code is constantly changing. Everything is, is in constant flux. It's so hard to stay on top of all this stuff. I, I, I don't know why we're just making things more and more complicated. I really wish that there would be some rubric to any of this code to stay within or something that it just would work. And this is what I strive for. If you've made it this far in the video, I strive for consistency and I'm trying to move towards improvement in consistency in everything that we do. There's so much 
There's so much work to be done in this area that I'm baffled by how these, these companies keep making the same darn quads over and over and over. And it's the same thing. Why are you making the same? Like people keep buying the same thing constantly over and over and over. And we keep going around in circles when all that money could be spent in just improving things. And then you would get to a point where things are freaking beyond incredible and I'm just going to keep going on and on. I hope this was helpful for somebody. <laughs> I hope this doesn't cause people to unsubscribe from my channel because it was a lot of stuff to go through. And I did a really bad job of honestly presenting it all because as I was presenting it, there was so much more in my mind that I could have spit out. And this video could have gone on for days, but I just had to put it out there just to kind of help people hopefully with something and refer to this video when people ask me for another PID tuning video because it's a lot more complicated and this is just not my forte, not my area. I try to build things within the envelope of function for the code to make it work properly. But I also enjoy building extreme things like this, which honestly is not that extreme, but it should it, like it, it, it just happens to be extreme for the code. Anyways, take care, floss your teeth. Thanks for watching. If you made it this far, bye.